Okay, so my name's Rob Savoy, and I'm a longtime volunteer firefighter and disaster tech for about 30 years, and um, conveniently also a software engineer, um, primarily um, focusing on the GNU toolchain, Linux kernel stuff, free software, not open source, by the way, um, and stuff like that. And I got heavily into mapping originally. Do I need to? Okay. Uh, m uh, mapping as a climber, because I spent a lot of time as a mountain guide when I was a lot younger in weird places that were really hard to find, which turned into a lifetime love of mapping and stuff like that. And so I'm in two rural, small rural fire departments in the mountains of Colorado. And um, I'll need to say, um, the maps where we were, were were pretty bad. And then currently these days, I'm also the senior tech lead at, at HOT. Um, so my fire district is huge. Um, you're talking 200 square miles of primarily national forest and mountainside. Um, needless to say, it was not very well mapped. If you plugged directions into Google, you wound up in Denver, which wasn't very useful, things like that. We have only a handful of paved roads. Almost everything where we are is a uh, dirt road, often a glorified deep track. Um, access get becomes pretty interesting. Um, we have no fire hydrants. So when we need water sources, we need to know places where we can pull water out of creeks. So at our altitude, we're between... Just keep talking. Okay, we're, our district runs between 8,000 to 14,000 feet. We already go up all the way to the Continental Divide. At that altitude, you can only pull water eight feet. So finding those locations where I can bring in a full-size fire truck on a decent dirt road and suck water up eight feet is a skill set. Um, we've mapped all those. It's been extremely useful because running out of water means your house is gone. Um, we do a lot of mutual aid to other small rural fire departments where we are. Nobody has enough people and crews because we're all volunteers to do anything past a small campfire. So we spend a lot of time going to other fire departments. OpenStreetMap has been great for that because I focus on mapping the other departments more than our own because we know our own district, but often when we're responding to someplace far away, um, having maps help us find these things called fire hydrants because we don't know where their creeks are and things like that. Um, we have tons and tons and tons of distributed campsites, i.e. campsites not in a campground, just random people have built these things over decades and decades and decades, and they often have um, medical problems, you know, they hit the dispensary after the airport, and they went to 14,000 feet, okay. So we map all these little campsites so that we can actually find them. Um, which gets kind of, yeah, that's an interesting talk there. Um, and they're literally all over the place. Some of them are miles off a trailhead. Some of them are close to roads. I mean, it's quite a variety. But being able to find them has been very, very useful a bunch of times. Um, and then we also found out as a small volunteer, we actually are a nonprofit fire department. Um, our, one of our main sources of funding is we do deployments all over Western United States. So we spend a lot of time in California and Wyoming and Utah and Idaho. Um, so we've done a lot of mapping there, although not to the level I'm about to get into and things like that. Um, and then lately, my department was in the two fires in Boulder, um, both the Marshall Fire and last weekend, <laughs> the NCAR Fire. Luckily, they had better maps because they're down on the plains, not up in the mountains. Um, so we have a lot of big problems. Google probably had barely over half the addresses in our entire fire district. So when we'd get an address, like nobody could find it. Um, a lot of the roads are also not in Google. Google doesn't really care about Jeep tracks, even if there's 100 people living at the end of the road, which is whatever, that's their business, they can do what they want. Um, so we use these things called paper map books. They're about three inches thick, and you have like four houses per page, and you'd be like, trying to find some obscure location while driving really fast in a big fire truck didn't work out very good. You'd have to pull over and check your map and you're like, you know that every minute you're looking for where you're going, the house is burning to the ground. Um, it only takes about 15 minutes, to be honest. It's kind of depressing. Um, it, was, it was terrible. Um, a lot of the other problem we've had is access. A lot of our roads won't fit a full-size fire truck. So I have to know, hey, you know, there's a fire here. Do I have to bring a fire truck? Do I bring a brush truck? Do I bring a UTV? Am I grabbing a pack and hiking in? Sometimes all of the above. There's, like I can take the fire truck this far, then I downsized another apparatus. Um, OSM has been great that way, being able to sort of figure out the resource planning for the fire response um, before I've even barely left the station, haven't even gotten in the apparatus um, and things like that. Um, the old Tiger data, how many people here suffered through Tiger? Yeah, figures. It was really... Embarrassing is the polite way to put it where I live. Um, roads didn't connect, roads didn't even exist, the names were completely wrong. I mean, Tiger was, was kind of a mess. I mean, it literally took years to fix Tiger in just one county. Um, 
oh, too far away. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, living in a recreational area between two wilderness areas and a national forest is we have tons and tons and tons of trails. Google doesn't really care about hiking trails. Some of the other folks here with booths obviously do. But once again, you know, we have medical call at a distributed campsite. How do we get there? Um, fishermen in particular, they're pretty cool about like getting as far off the trail as possible to find their great fishing spot. And then if they have a medical problem at altitude, we have to still find them. So we have attendance, and there's a lot of unofficial mountain biking trails, hiking trails, old logging roads. I mean, the diversity is amazing. And we've literally mapped all of that. Because if you have a fire in the back country, we want to know how to get there. Um, and that's kind of pretty important. Um, and then, of course, once again, the water sources, um, things like that. Um, so this is a classic response for us <laughs> um, and things like that. So notice the guy with the chainsaw cutting your tree out of the way. <laughs> um, and so this is really common for us. And we were trying, this one we were looking for a wildland fire. We saw the smoke up in the mountainside and we were trying to find it, right? And while you can blast off through the mountains and start walking in the forest with no trails, you ever walked a mile and a half off trail and try to remember how you got there and how to go back to where you started? Um, that gets to be kind of m messy. Um, one of the things I'm a big fan of, I'll probably t mention this in a bunch of slides, is for those of us who, who map trails and roads, um, surface, smoothest, track type, with tags, super important. Um, we typically use OSM and in all of our fire apparatus, and so it very nicely makes them display all differently. So when I look at the map, I'm like, yeah, 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 go get the UTV on the trailer and meet me at the trailhead, you know, and things like that. And without those tags, it's just a line on the map. You know, I know there's parts of Colorado which are, that Google basically takes you through the national parks on Jeep trails and everybody gets stuck. And OpenStreetMap correctly routes around those to the maintained trails. Uh, very nice and stuff like that. Um, and then this particular apparatus, yeah, we carry all sorts of weird equipment. It's a kind of a mini fire truck, mostly for backcountry rescue. Um, we spend a lot of time on fires hiking where there's no trails. Um, and like I said, we may hike in three miles with no trail. And um, a lot of classically, like, you know, where did you park? You know, you, you show up in a hurry, you park your fire truck, you all jump out, you grab your gear, and you run up the mountainside, and an hour later, everybody's like, where do we put the fire truck? <laughs> um, so a lot of times when we're hiking in, um, I'll, ma I'll map a track. I'll use OSM and or OSM tracker, and I'll map the track so at least I can turn around. And then that way, a few hours later, like, we can at least see where everything was. Um, but yeah, the parking sounds really funny. It's a problem. Um, especially because usually you fight fire till just about dark and then you hike back out and you're on some dirt road and everybody's like, is this the right road? <laughs> um, it gets pretty interesting. Um, and I'm a huge big fan of offline topo maps and um, satellite imagery, especially when we're hiking off trail. We spend a lot of time uh, doing backcountry rescues above tree line. And there's obviously you don't need a trail because there's no trees and things like that. And so. Um, Having the sad imagery is useful. A couple of years ago, I was on a medical call, and as we came down through the tree line to where the helicopter was landed, we're all like, oh, the tree line is really thick when you come down to that level. And I was with this rescue team, and they're like, well, how are we going to get through all these bushes and trees? And I whipped up sad imagery and said, oh, yeah, we'll just go over here. There's where it's least dense. And he's like, oh, can I get a copy of that? Um, all the rescue teams use OpenStreetMap in my part of Colorado for this basic reason. Um, and offline usage is really important because until a few years ago, we had no cell phone coverage in our entire county, which is kind of nice. I kind of miss that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do a lot of backcountry rescues. It's kind of our bread and butter. Um, once again, like water sources, helicopter landing zones have a specific criteria. Um, most people don't do that. We just can't really pick them at random. So every time we find a really good, obscure backcountry LZ, we add it to the map. And um, all OpenStreetMap's got great tagging and stuff for landing zones and things like that. And the nice thing about that is, is that um, I can basically give that to the pilot even before we're there because I already know where it is because we often get there the airplanes and the helicopters going kind of early. Um, and that's also been useful too. The biggest impact of that has been that um, we have a lot of new firefighters in my district. I'm kind of the old school, old guy. <laughs> um, and it lets a lot of our new folks who aren't used to our part of Colorado find helicopter landing zones and water sources. It's been a great, great training aid to let all of our new folks be as efficient as a lot of us old farts who just don't live anywhere else. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, th the maps are pretty bad. And at one point, I decided to apply all the technology that we use at HOT for international disasters to my local fire district. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so um, 
one of the first things we had to do was uh, roads. So road names are very flexible where I am. Um, even worse than that, the county renamed a whole bunch of roads 20 years ago, and Google, for example, never updated. Um, we have things like where I live, you can name your driveway, and it actually isn't on anybody's map, but when they say, oh yeah, I'm having a heart attack, and here's my address. Actually, it's not a real address. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting, but we actually added a lot of that kinds of stuff. Um, obviously, fixing Tiger, that was a multi-year project. Um, things like that. Fixing a lot of, uh, the, the naming was interesting. So I got public domain sources from the county and the state and then wrote software that conflated road names between like six different map sources to get what was the most accurate and things like that. A um, lot of work with USGS. 90% of our roads are actually Forest Service reference numbers in addition to the county name, the state name, and then of course what the locals call it. So it gets kind of interesting like that. And so a lot of what I worked on was getting all the right naming correct and things like that. I got a copy of all the addresses. Um, addresses are super important for firefighters. Like, like I checked today, there's no addresses in Tucson and OpenStreetMap at all. Um, but where we live, you know, we really need those addresses to find people and adding the addresses was really, really good for us. Um, as I said, surface track type is really important. What this happened for us is, um, it said it helps our new firefighters be effective. Um, we dropped our response time almost by half because now we can find everything effectively. So at that point we realized, huh. So we went up to our insurance company. We were in ISO 10, which means you're basically screwed. Um, and we went to our insurance company with statistics on improved data access. And we went to an ISO 5 and thereby saved everybody in our fire district $100 a year on their homeowner's insurance. So if you fix the maps, you can save your friends and neighbors actually potentially a lot of money. And as I say, you can actually do this too um, because it's really what it takes. Um, so data validation, you know, what the street sign says is what the firefighter uses to figure out if they're in the right place. Um, a lot of our roads have four or five names and whoever calls it in may use one name or the other. And so, you know, we search for the road name and then we figure out the address. That's worked out really good. But you even want the locals call it. We have a lot of what locals call things that aren't on anybody's map, but we all still use it, and they use that referring to locations. Um, and the other thing, too, is when you see weirdnesses in the data, go there, camp out, you know, map the data, do validation. Um, I've been doing a lot of that. Lots of new gates are showing up, so I've been mapping all the new gates and things like that. Um, and I'm a big fan of working offline as much as possible, because if you've been out field mapping all day, you want to update the data that night, so that, because in a week from now, you're going to kind of forget. Um, once again, the multiple names and references, be consistent with names, like for service references numbers, FS space reference number, because if you've got some sort of a three different ways of naming for service roads, you don't know what to type in the search to actually find anything. Make sure all your highways connect so that navigation and routing work. Um, adding driveways is awesome. Where we live, a lot of times we can't tell the difference between a driveway and a Jeep trail. And so having the driveway on a map which shows up different, we can count down driveways. Oh, three more driveways up than the Jeep trail. Works up. It's really, really useful, and OSM and is nice because it displays them differently. Um, before I run out of time, I'll zip through this, find me later. We use a lot of tools. Um, ODK Collect I use a lot for field data mapping. Um, OSM and for display. All of our fire trucks have 10-inch tablets mounted in the dashboards um, for offline navigation. Um, a lot of editing with JAWSM. Um, I use Mobile Atlas for making um, base maps of sad imagery and topo map backgrounds. Um, it's also open source, but it's a really good way to make offline base maps. Um, and I have a bunch of homegrown software, being an engineer, you know, I have software for conflating between multiple data sources, correcting road names, merging addresses in the buildings, um, things like that. Um, lots of conflation software um, and stuff like that, which is actually open source if you need to conflate building imports. Um, and those are kind of the tools that I typically use. So I'll zip through this because you guys know all these things. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of ODK Collect. We use it a lot in HOT for a lot of disaster mapping. Um, it's really, really good. I'm like a big fan of X forms, even though some people think they're kind of complicated. Um, OSM and obviously we, we really like the fact that we can navigate offline. That is incredibly useful. And I use the custom layers a lot. Like I may have a custom overlay that has fire hydrants in somebody's district, um, private hiking trails that aren't publicly accessible, but l landowners let us use them across their ranch, things like that. And so that's also been very useful. Um, JAWSM, of course, Everybody here probably knows JAWS, and I'll make that fast. Um, Mobile Atlas is actually pretty nice, and you can add additional data sources. So if you don't have one of the defaults, you can add you know, Esri Sat Imagery or Google Hybrid or Microsoft or whatever you want. But I use this a lot for offline base maps. And when we do deployments out of state, I make them base maps for the area where they're going to be fighting fire. 
um, which has been helpful. Um, and then Homegrown Software, being a developer, I build all my APKs from source primarily because I feel as a developer, if I find bugs, it's my duty to respond, you know, report that to the development team to improve the quality of their software. Um, I have a lot of software that I wrote before Hot that I'm now fixing at Hot for conf building conflation, address imports, validating highway names, things like that. A lot of weird data extraction, like some people use this Google Maps, so I make them KML files of the same layers that the rest of us at OSM and have, and things like that. And then my last thing here is for ODK Collect users, um, I have a really nice program for pulling data off your phone from ODK Collect, translating the XML sort of freeform format into really nice OSM tagging with data validation mixed in. Um, looking for people to want to work on this project with me. <laughs> um, and that's also really, really useful too because um, we use ODK Collect so much and the process of going from ODK Collect to OpenStreetMap is on a good day, tedious, boring, and time consuming. And so by automating a lot of the conversion and things like that has been really, really useful for me getting data from my phone into my laptop and into OpenStreetMap as efficiently as possible.